Dear open-minded progressive, perhaps you were hor- I'm going for a snooze. I'm putting this on the background. Okay, base. All right. <laughs> horrified by chapter 10. I was actually horrified by chapter 10 on how not so well written it was, actually. I mean, I lie. did propose the liquidation of democracy, the constitution, and the rule of law, and the transfer of absolute power to a mysterious figure known only as the receiver, who, in the process of converting Washington into a, a heavily ball. armed, ultra-profitable corporation, will abolish the press, smash the universities, sell the public schools, and transfer de-civilized populations to secure relocation facilities, where they will be assigned to mandatory apprenticeships. If this doesn't horrify you, I'm not sure what would. And do I even mean it seriously, or am I just ripping off Daniel Defoe? Dear open-minded progressive, perhaps you have come to realize that your narrator is not always a reliable one. He has played tricks on you in the past. He will probably do it again. The game is deep, and not for the unwatchful. The first thing to remember is that by even reading these horrible, horrible things, you have demonstrated exactly how open your mind is. You are in the 99.99th percentile of open-minded progressives. You are certainly one of the most open-minded people in the world. Your only conceivable worry is- Holy shit. Guys, we are one of the most open-minded people in the world. Can you, can you guys believe it? Guys, we're being complimented right now by Minch's Moldbug. Do you guys feel honored? I feel honored. Is that your mind is so open that your brain has fallen out. Obviously, <gasps> this is a real danger, but life is dangerous. The second thing to remember is that no one else endorses this plan, or even anything close. Yeah, In the political world of 2008, restorationism is completely off the map. It is off the table. It is outside the room. It is outside the building. It is running stark naked and crazy through the woods. Is that his In a voice word, or AI it voice? It is pure mold buggery. But this is this is another uh, you know mold bug fan's voice. Um, this guy created some uh, you know audiobook or something like that, like for it. But because at present we do live in a democracy, this means it is not dangerous. At least, not at present. It could become dangerous, of course. Perhaps if you are was as popular as stuff white people like. Which it ain't, and which it won't be. But what better reason to keep an eye on it? The third thing to remember is that the whole plan of restoration through national bankruptcy is predicated on the assumption that the bankruptcy administrator, the nefarious receiver, is responsible, effective, and not least sane. Clearly, if he or she turns out to be Hitler or Stalin, we have just recreated Nazism or Stalinism. Even if you agree with me that Washington is the malignant tumor of the ages, morally, intellectually, and financially bankrupt, dead in the water and drifting towards Niagara, you can't cure cancer with cyanide and LSD. And the fourth thing to remember, dear open-minded progressive, is that if perhaps you can be convinced that some things you used to think were good are actually evil, you can be convinced that some things you used to think were evil were actually good. After all, you do have an open mind. No sensible mind is very open on this side of the skull, though, and for good reason. If there is a crack, it is a narrow one. What? Wait, what is he saying? The third thing he remembers is that the whole plan of restoration through not his predicate on the assumption that the bankruptcy administrator, the nefarious receiver, is one of the things not least saying. Clearly, if he it turns out to be Hitler, we have just recreated Nazism. If you agree with me that Washington is the malignant. <sighs> the fourth thing to remember, dear open mind, for God, is that perhaps you can be convinced that some things you used to think were good are actually evil. You can be convinced that some things you used to think were evil are actually good. After all, you do have a mental mind. No sensible mind is very open. No. We're open minded, but not stupid, right? Like. We're we're open minded but not impressionable, right? Like I, I hope I hope that's the assumption. But yeah. Hopes to fit it must fit a postcard. So let's swing straight at the ball. The problem of political alignment. Should you be leftist, a rightist, or a centrist? 
Perhaps we can answer the I'm question from first principle. Okay. <laughs> Suppose a great wind whips us into space and sets us down on an Earth-like planet, Erplat, which is completely foreign to us. We quickly discover that Erplat has a democratic political system just like ours. Moreover, Erplat's political thinkers are always squabbling just like ours. And even better, an Erplatian position in this long-standing conflict can be described usefully by a single linear dimension, just like our left and right. However, the political axis of Erplat is transformed in some unknown way from ours. Its poles are not left and right, but M and Q. You have no way of knowing how M and Q might map to Earth terms. MQ could be left-right, or right-left, or some other weird thing. What you know is that M and Q are contradictory principles. Each is some fundamental understanding of human society which indisputably contradicts the other. Of course, it is possible for any person to maintain some combination of M beliefs and Q beliefs, most simply by using the M principle to understand one issue and the Q principle for another. This creates the weird phenomenon of a continuous dimension between M and Q, when the question obviously has a fundamentally Boolean quality. Furthermore, M and Q can be easily misapplied, and either can be combined with any sort of venal or sadistic nastiness. Thus, evaluating the actions of individuals who claim to follow the M or Q principles is not a straightforward way to evaluate the choices between M and Q. We know there is a choice because we know that at most one of M and Q can be good and true. We must therefore conclude that the other is evil and wrong. Of course, both could be evil and wrong. If we find that one is evil and wrong, we should do another checkup to ensure that the other is good and true. But if we find that one is good and true, the matter is settled. The other is the dark side of the force. Moreover, the choice matters. Because on Erplat, humans have special Jedi powers. Only we can wield the weapon of the Urpladin Jedi, the Iron Mouse, and it takes both of us, you dear open-minded progressive, and me, the close-minded reactionary. If we can agree, we can either end the conflict permanently in favor of M or Q, or any mixture of the two. Any dissent will be promptly silenced by the mouse. So what criteria can we use to decide between M and Q? The many followers of each great way, of course, are lobbying us with Beluga and Porsches and Blondes, or at least the Urplatin equivalent of these fine goods. Nevertheless, we are stern, and will choose only the truth. A simple test, A, might be to take a vote. If more Urplatins prefer M, know, their like planet will be governed for the know. indefinite future on the M principle. If they favor Q, likewise. But frankly, this is shite. If Q is evil and the Urplatins vote for Q, we have just condemned them and their children to a world of infinite suffering. Past Qist movements have perhaps been tempered by a modicum of M, mere personal decency, or mitigating venality. But if we enforce Q with the Iron Mouse, there will be no escape. If Q is wrong, wrong shall result. You may not have a problem with this, but I do, and it takes both sides of us to move the mouse. And is there... Oh, okay, thank you for the 99 cents. Wait, hold on. I forgot to add in the, uh... Fonju's super chat. I was just thinking about my far-right content creator. Yeah, she arises as summoned by thought alone. Ah, oh, cute. Look at that. I am far-right indeed. Yes. True. I am far right. Yes, very far right. Okay. Is there any way in which we can guarantee that the headcount of her Platin supporters corresponds to the absolute truth or falsity of M or Q? Answer, no. Many, perhaps even most, of the Urplatins are dumb as rocks. Therefore, this test is not useful. A simple way to fix the test, B, is to restrict the vote to Urplatins who are at least as smart as whichever of the two of us is dumber. That way, we cannot possibly agree to describe any voter as dumb as a rock. The description is inherently insulting to one of us. So, we are only considering the view of smart Urplatins. Even better, if we see a difference between smart Urplatins and dumb Urplatins, we can penalize... What he's talking about right now, uh, if you guys uh, don't know what he's saying, is that uh, right now there are two principles. There are, there are M and then there's Q, okay? And... um. 
right now, okay, uh, you, democracy could vote in favor of M and democracy could vote in favor of Q. However, um, most voters and most people are dumb, okay? They're uneducated, they're dumb, they're poor, or whatever, right? Um, so therefore, if Q is evil and people vote for Q, then you have condemned everybody to suffering. So basically, um, what he's saying is that, but the people are retarded, right? Like when it comes to voting, that's what, that's what basically he's saying. Um, uh, it's the classical argument of like the reason why democracy doesn't work is because the voters are dumb. Um, that's why it needs to be ruled by a vanguard party. Um, right. The, that kind of argument, except he's not making the advocacy for a vanguard party. His prescription is neo-monarchism, which is not a vanguard party, but the one ruler, right. Which is like, um, voted in or chosen by the board. Right. That's different. Um, but yeah, that's what MNQ is instead of he, because he doesn't really view it as like right and left, right. He doesn't want to view it as right and left. He wants it to view it as M and Q because um, it, you know, it, it could be like establishment versus anti-establishment or any kind of principle versus like the opposite of that principle, right? Like that's what that means. Yeah. As whichever principle, M or Q, is popular with the dumb ones. If we see that Q is generally believed by smarter platins and M is more popular with the dumb ones, we pretty much have the answer. Chosen by the right? Vanguard, basically. Okay. Um, well, yes, sort of. Uh, well, yes, sort of. But at the same, well, chosen by the oligarchs. Okay, chosen by the oligarchs. Let's just say that. Um, is it also inherently taking the position that you apparently can educate people better? Yeah, uh, basically. That's not worth the time to educate people better for them to vote, but you can still educate better for them in order for them to work in a capitalist state, if that makes sense, right? Um, so so it doesn't mean that you can't educate people. It just means that you can still educate people, but you would need to, you would still need for them to be educated, to be working in a company state. Um, but you wouldn't be educating them to have enough knowledge about politics, right? Like for example, you wouldn't be educating them on foreign issues, on, you know, domestic issues, about border crises. That kind of stuff is up to, um, you know, the monarchist, The uh, it's up to the board. That stuff is for these people, right? Um, and for the, you know, the bureaucratic people who are working for them, the spies, the whatever the fuck, right? The intelligence network. Um, these, uh, the, all the other stuff that is going on, um, underneath, they don't need to learn about that kind of stuff. Instead, all they need to learn is about their designated place in society, um, in order to keep the, you know, the machine running and the machine that makes money, right? The, the sweatshop, the great sweatshop, right? Yeah. Let's assume Q is the smart position and M is the dumb position. We know one fact about Erplat. Does this tell us that Q is good and true, and M is wrong and evil? At the very least, this proposition depends on the intelligence of Erplatins. If a dumb Erplatin has an IQ of 80, in Earth terms, and a smart one has an IQ of 120, we can pretty easily see that on any question on which they might disagree, the latter is more likely to be right. Or can we? How do we know this? And is our result the same if the IQs are, say, 120 and 160 respectively? I think anyone who makes democracy doesn't work because some people don't have a complete view of reality uh, misses the point of both democracy and reality. Um, I know that Kraut makes the argument that uh, the reason why democracy is so great is because it, it allows mistakes to happen. Is that at least the intrinsic idea that people ha feel like they have the right of self-determination makes them feel as if that like, oh yeah, like this is something worth having even though we're gonna keep making mistakes, right? Is that if you keep on feeling like you are making, you know, the right decisions, but by the right absolute power rulers, 
um, even then, it feels like the agency is taken away by like from the people. You want to give agency back to the people. You want to feel like the people have agency. When the agency is taken away by the people, now they feel like they have the need to riot and to you know rise up against the ruler. However, in you know um, in Mencius Moldbug's writing, um, he essentially also has the prescription of anti-rebellion, right? Like re-education camps, um, you know, very China-like measures, propaganda, that kind of stuff. Basically, oh, you're misbehaving? Let's not make a big show of it. We're going to kidnap you and then we're going to re-educate you, right? Like that is basically what he's saying, yeah. It's also fun to listen to this living in a liberal democracy. That's the strongest country, the biggest economy. There are definitely some not so minor issues, but come on, bro. Uh, yeah, yeah, of course. This is why I am a sock dem is because I do believe in a liberal democracy. But it's fun to also analyze, you know, this kind of stuff as well and to figure out why they think the way they do um, and why they think like their system works, right? Um, because they genuinely do believe their system works. I have no doubt about that. And I have no doubt that Mencius Mobug also thinks that his system works. But the thing is, is that like, um, you know, the stuff that he's talking about, I just, um, I don't know. I just, I don't, I, I just personally do not know. So is he making an argument of criticism of democracy or is his argument more about education and agency? Um, his argument is an, in, is, is about, is against an inherent problem about democracy is that people will all there will always exist dumb people so therefore democracy will not work inherently uh unless it's restricted to like the very tippy top but then at that point you can't really call it a democracy anymore right well i mean it's still democracy they're still voting at the top but the thing is is that like it's like very far removed from me. It's a fucking oligarchy. It's a, it's an oligarchical democracy at that point right like that's what we should call it that's the most accurate way to put it right does that make sense so, yeah, that's about it. Uh, so, this theory is being re reductive about intelligence and voting. People live in certain environment can lead to voting people, not to mention the influence money and politics. Uh, from what I know, you know, money and politics just doesn't really seem, from, from what I hear, it really, doesn't really seem to be that big of a deal, but we can always go into, you know, um, the, the stuff about that, um, democracy is current because people may choose wrong. Yeah, but some people may argue that you should give people the ability to choose wrong because it's like how a child under a parent might learn mistakes um, just so they can learn from their mistakes so then later on they don't make these mistakes down the line. Um, and then later on, they gain an ability of like, you know, self-independence. So this is like the same kind of concept that uh, people, uh, I, I feel like kind of, you know, miss, I don't know. Um, that's about it. Sorry. I'm going to get my coffee. Jesus. Hold on. I'm going to let this play. What about 160 and 250? Surely it is neurologically possible for an Urplatin to have an arbitrarily high intelligence, at least as measured by any human scale. And if the proposition is true for stupid equals 160 and smart equals 250, it means that an Urplatin with an IQ of 160 can be fooled by whichever of M or Q is evil and wrong. If so, one with an IQ of 120 can surely be fooled. Since one can never be so stupid that one can't discover the truth by throwing darts, it is therefore possible for the Urplatins of IQ 80 to be right and those of IQ 120 to be wrong which violates the proposition. So we cannot learn that M or Q is right or wrong just because the smart or platins follow Q and the stupid ones cling to M. However, this fact does tell us something. Q is more competitive than M. Think of Q and M as two populations of parasites competing for a one population of hosts. Ignoring the fact that Urplatins can harbor a mixture of Q and M perspectives on different subjects, or simply not care, <sighs> simplify the problem by imagining that each Urplatin has a Boolean flag, Q or M. Although neither Q nor M may have any central organizing body responsible for the propagation of Qism or Mness, if there was such an intellectual central planner, it would choose the smart hosts over the less smart ones. If you are a sexually transmitted virus, you want to be in a promiscuous gay host, preferably an airline Jesus. steward. 
if you are an intellectually Jesus. transmitted Jesus Jesus principle you want to be in a smart and loquacious host preferably a university professor we expect to see some corollaries of this QMA symmetry Jesus. and we do if smart people Holy are more likely shit. to host Q we'd expect Q to be more fashionable than M if you want to get ahead <sighs> in life acting smart is always a good start whether you're smart or not if smart people tend to host Q hosting Q is a great way to look smart Q becomes a sort of social lubricant Anywhere, anytime, the best way to meet and mate with other young, fashionable people is to broadcast one's Q-ness as loudly and proudly as possible. Also, if Q is more competitive than M, we'd expect to see Q progressing against M over time. Again, this is exactly what we see. The M-Q conflict is at least a hundred years old, and when we exhume the frozen thoughts of century-old Qists from dusty old libraries, their specific beliefs would put them deep in the M range often at extreme M levels, if lived today. But does any of this answer the question? It does not. At least one of Q or M is darkness, but we cannot tell which. If Q is the dark side and M is mere sanity, we see immediately what Q is, a transmissible mental disease, which spreads by infecting education workers. If Q is mere sanity and M is the dark side, this same system is in the business of overcoming superstition Oh god, I am so sleepy today. What the fuck? <laughs> Jesus. And leading the people of Urplat, despite the ancient prejudices to which they stubbornly cling, toward the truth. And this is certainly how Qists see the matter. And if they are both evil? But this is difficult to imagine. If both M and Q are dark, there must be some truth which contradicts them both. And it must be less successful than either M or Q. To a Qist, the situation makes perfect sense. The progress toward Q is the slow and painful victory of good over evil. Evil has many advantages because it can avail itself of evil strategies, whereas the good restrict themselves to achieving good ends by good means. However, the truth has a great advantage. It rings clear like a bell. No lie can fake it. There is just one small problem with this explanation. We would expect M to disappear much more quickly than it already has. If M is a lie, and it is socially disadvantageous to express it, why, after 200 years, do we still have M? All the cards are stacked against it. Whereas, if Q is a lie, and M is the truth, we have all the ingredients for an eternal soap opera. Q has the snaky suppleness of mendacity, its tasty apple flavor, its stylish and sinful delights. M has the rigid backbone of a truth that can be suppressed, but never quite crushed that reappears spontaneously wherever men and women, often of the socially awkward subspecies, have the misfortune to think for themselves. We've constructed what Professor Burke would call a narrative, but compared to the level of tough thinking that we'd need to actually demonstrate that Q is the dark side and M is the light, our narrative has the strength of tissue paper. It is enough for suspicion, and no more. Therefore, we need to pull the veil aside and see, look at what M and Q actually mean. Note that we are still on Urplat. We are not claiming that M and Q correspond to right and left, or left and right, or anything of the sort. We are just devising abstract meanings for M and Q that could, on this imaginary planet we've made up, correspond to the facts we've stipulated. M and Q can coexist, M and Q are contradictory, and Q is consistently more fashionable than M. Our definitions of M and Q revolve around the ancient Urplatian word nomos. If you are for M, you are for the nomos, which makes you pronomian. If you are for Q, you are against the nomos, which makes you antinomian. The contradiction is obvious. Let's start by explaining the nomos and its supporters, the pronomian. The nomos is the natural structure of formal promises around which Urplatans organize their lives. To any pronomian, any Urplatan should be free to make any promise. In return, he or she can expect to be held responsible for that promise. There is no freedom to break it. All promises are voluntary until they are made, and involuntary afterwards. A pair of reciprocal promises, a common phenomenon on Urplat, is an agreement. The details of individual promises and agreements are infinite and constantly changing. But the high-level structure of the nomos is a consequence of reality, and it changes little. To demonstrate this point, let's derive the nomos from pure reality. First, Urplatians are not robots. 
they breed in families just as we do. The Erplatian family is based on two agreements, one between the parents of the little Erplatian tyke and one between the child and its parents. To a pronomian, the relationship between parents and children is simple. The agreement has only one side. Children promise their parents everything, including complete obedience for as long as the parents require. Parents need make no promise to a newborn infant because an infant is helpless and cannot compel any concession. If they choose, they can emancipate the child when it comes of age. If they choose, they can require it to serve them all their lives. They even hold power of life and death over it again until they relinquish this power. The pronomian supports both prenatal and postnatal abortion. Note that this regime, which does not exactly match the family law of, say, California, but is more or less an accurate description of the situation in early Rome, is optimal for the parents. In other words, in other words parents can have no reason to prefer a legal system which gives them less power over their children. If they want to relinquish this power or even assign it to others, nothing is stopping them. Note also the asymmetry of the agreement between parents and child. By recognizing the helplessness of the infant, we recognize that it has no choice but to accept any definition of the relationship that its parents may propose. The agreement is a promise in one direction, because the child has no power to compel any reciprocal promise. The pronomian sees these kinds of patterns everywhere in the nomos. There is only one nomos because there is only one reality. The parameters of parenting do not change. The power dynamics are known. The answer is final. If men and women, not to mention children, were in all cases honest and trustworthy, they could cooperate without a structure of formal promises. Since they are not, they benefit from the formal promises and mechanisms for enforcing those promises. But to the pronomian, this structure is no more than a recognition of reality. One of the simplest patterns of agreement is property. Property is a system in which one or platin claims the sole power to dominate some good play with a toy, drive a car, fence off a plot of land, and all other Erplatins promise to respect that right. As the relationship between parents and infants, the origin of property is the balance of power. In a world which contains no property agreements whatsoever, Erplatins can construct a property system based on the reality of current possession. Another key pattern is the proprietorship. The marriage we saw above is a sample case of partnership. In general, however, a proprietorship exists whenever multiple Erplatins decide to work collaboratively on a shared enterprise. There are two ingredients to a proprietorship, collective identity and fractional ownership. Collective identity allows the proprietorship to act as a unit, to make and collect promises of its own. Fractional ownership divides the enterprise into precisely defined shares which in an anonymous proprietorship can be traded as property. It's probably best not to define your marriage as an anonymous proprietorship. The natural structure of a proprietorship is that ownership benefit and control are synonymous, i.e. if you divide the enterprise into a hundred shares, each share owns a hundredth of the business, receives a hundredth of the profit, and exercises a hundredth of the decision-making power. Of course, it is possible to construct a system of agreements which does not follow this pattern, but in most cases there is no need to. Again, the nomos is not prescriptive. These structures emerge as natural patterns of agreement. But the most important structure in the nomos is the hierarchy of protection. Protection is what makes all these promises work. A protector is an enforcer of promises. For some promises, in some contexts, protection is not necessary. The cost of breaking any promise may exceed the gain to the promise breaker. For example, someone who has a reputation for breaking promises may have trouble forming new agreements. This is an unusual condition, however, and not to be relied on. In many contexts, e.g. insider trading, a broken promise can be worth all an individual's reputation and more. By definition, above the top level of the hierarchy of protection, there is no protector. That top level, therefore, consists of unprotected authorities, typically proprietorships, but sometimes persons. These unauthorities have no authority which can settle their disputes. They must resort to war, which in Erplatin is called ultima ratio regum, i.e. the last resort of unauthorities. Unauthorities do, however, make promises to each other. For example, an unauthority must possess an area of land to which it maintains exclusive control, an undomain. What the heck are you listening to? 
We're listening to Far Right Theory. I love Far Right Theory. Don't you love Far Right Theory? <clears throat> yeah. Because its operations must be somewhere. If it lacks an undomain, it is subject to the protection of some other unauthority, and thus cannot be an unauthority itself. The undomain of the unauthority is its property because, as described above, all others have agreed to respect it, but it has no protector other than itself. The key to success as an unauthority is to ensure that no other unauthority has a positive incentive to violate its promises to you. For example, disrespect of property rights, invasion, is the simplest form of unprotected promise violation. To prevent such assaults, an unauthority must maintain the military and political strength to make the assailant regret the decision to attack. Any less punishment is inadequate, any more is vindictive. An unauthority makes a crucial mistake when it relinquishes the responsibility of protecting itself to another, stronger unauthority. If unauthorities cooperate against a common threat, they should cooperate for a limited time and a specific reason, and their league should be a league of equals. For an Earth example, Poland, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, and Romania make a good defense league. Poland, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, and England do not make a good defense league because the best case of the relationship is that the first three have become protectorates of the last, i.e. they are already halfway to being its property. Even Urplatin living within an unauthority's undomain is its client. To be the client of an undomain is to promise it absolute and unconditional obedience. No authority has any use for internal enemies. Moreover, an unauthority cannot be compelled to respect any promise it may make to its clients. There is no force that can compel it. Clients must rely on the desire of the unauthority to maintain its reputation for fair dealing. Fortunately, an unauthority is a business by definition. Its undomain is capital on which it naturally desires a maximum return. Its return on the property defines the value of the business, and is defined by the value of the subrights to the same property that it concedes to its clients. If its actions decrease this valuation, the unauthority's own stock goes down, and property in a lawless and mercurial undomain is certainly worth less than property protected by an unauthority which is careful of its reputation. On the same principle, because an unauthority maintains exclusive control within its undomain, it can and should enforce the promises that its clients make to each other. As we saw in the case of the parents, maximum promise enforcement is optimal customer service. Since the better the customer service, the higher the value of the property, and the higher the value of the property, the higher the value of the undomain, a prudent unauthority will do its best to uphold the nomos. So, for example, a may promise to B that he will serve B faithfully for the rest of his life, and B may have him whipped if he disobeys. In fact, since parents own their children, A may consign his child C to this same relationship, and so on through the generations. B, of course, presumably makes some promise in return for this remarkable concession. That's right, we have just reinvented hereditary slavery. We have also reinvented absolutist or divine Girl, do not, <clears throat> do not come, do not come. Right, monarchy, the Jew Gentium, and in fact, a whole menagerie of blasts from the past. We start to see why not everyone wants to be a pronomian. It is a separate discussion, really, but while we are talking about hereditary slavery, I can't resist mentioning A South Side View of Slavery by Reverend Nehemiah Adams. If your knowledge of the peculiar institution is derived entirely from Uncle Tom's Cabin, perhaps it's worth reminding you that Uncle Tom's Cabin was a propaganda novel. It's not quite like getting your views on Jews from Judsaiza, but... And if you prefer modern sources by respected academics, try this remarkably unpresentist presentation, whose agreement with Reverend Adams is quite impressive. Now let's look at the antinomian side of the ledger. As you may know, antinomian is actually an English word, and nomos is Greek. Okay, I lied, but I warned you.
It is usually applied in the archaic sense of religious law, but the derivation is sound, and the word is defensible in the present day. An antinomian is anyone who seeks, consciously or unconsciously, to disrupt or destroy the nomos. He is a breaker of oaths, a burner of deeds, a mocker of laws, at least from the pronomian perspective. From his own perspective, he is a champion of freedom and justice. I admit it. I am a pronomian. I endorse the nomos without condition. Fortunately, I do not have to endorse hereditary slavery, because any restoration of the nomos begins with the present state of possession, and at present there are no hereditary slaves. However, if you want to sell yourself and your children into slavery, I don't believe it is my business to object. Try and strike a hard bargain, at least. A slightly weakened form of pronomianism, perhaps more palatable in this day and age, might include mandatory emancipation at 21. So my idea of the antinomian perspective will be a little jaundiced, but I'll try to be fair. Perhaps the most refined form of modern antinomianism is libertarianism. Libertarianism is a fine example of the antinomian form, because the elements of the nomos that it attacks are specified with the elegant design sense that one would expect from the founder of modern libertarianism, probably the 20th century's greatest political theorist, Murray Rothbard. Rothbardian libertarianism rejects two aspects of the nomos. First, it rejects the entire concept of the unauthority, in Earthspeak, the principle of sovereignty. Rothbardians are called anarcho-capitalists for a reason. They deny the legitimacy of the state, unless operated according to strict Rothbardian principles. Note that they do not require, say, Disney to operate Disneyland according to libertarian principles. This because, to a Rothbardian, Disney's title to Disneyland is legitimate, whereas, say, Iceland's title to Iceland is not. Rothbard has an intricate system, borrowed originally from Locke, for determining whether or not a title is legitimate. To say that this system is unamenable to objective interpretation is to put it mildly. But the titles of existing unauthorities all appear to be illegitimate. This makes libertarianism a revolutionary ideology. Since its antinomianism is so restricted and its lust for blood is minimal, however, it is not an especially dangerous or effective one. Antinomians who reject sovereignty have two main alternatives. Either they support private, amorphous, and even territorially overlapping protection agencies, a design whose military plausibility is, to put it kindly, small, or they believe that government is legitimate if and only if it obeys a set of natural laws. Again, here we see the proximity to the pronomian, but the Rothbardian concept of natural law misses the Hobbesian fact that in the true nomos, there is no party that can enforce a state's promises to its clients. This matters because legalism without sovereignty has a simple result, the personal rule of judges. The error is to imagine the existence of a superhuman legal authority which can bind a state against itself, enforcing a government of laws, not men. As the bizarre encrustations of precedent that history builds up around every written constitution demonstrate, this is simply a political perpetual motion device. All governments are governments of men. If final decisions are taken by a council of nine, these nine are the nine who rule. Whether you call them a court, a junta, or a politburo is irrelevant. Since I am a bit of a geek, though, the Rothbardian interpretation that interests me the most is his approach to contract law. Note how Rothbard rejects the idea of binding promises and is forced to construct impossibly elaborate structures of property rights. If I promise to paint your house, I have really sold you a title to a paint job, and if I do not then paint your house, I am guilty of theft for having stolen said paint job, I think. The Rothbardian design breaks down completely in a frequently mentioned exception, the case of insider trading. Here is a randomly googled example of the kind of Jesuitic Talmudry to which libertarians resort when confronted with this problem. To a pronomian, the answer is simple. If you are to be given material, non-public information, you promise to go to jail if you disclose it. Note that this is exactly how it works. Know also that to anyone who has ever had a real job, the idea of legal insider trading is transparently ridiculous. 
The tactical error of the libertarian, Rothbardian or otherwise, is to believe that the state can be made smaller and simpler by making it weaker. Historically, the converse is the case. Attempts to weaken an unauthority either destroy it, resulting in chaos and death, or force it to compensate by enlarging, resulting in the familiar red giant state. The pronomian prefers a state that is small, simple, and very strong. It respects the rights of its clients not because it is forced to respect them, mm. but because it has a financial incentive to respect them. And it obeys that financial incentive because it is managed responsibly and effectively. All things considered, however, libertarianism is a mild, innocuous form of antinomianism. Let's skip immediately to the writer who may be the most popular philosopher on Earth today, Slavoj Žižek. Here we see antinomianism in an almost pure, indiscriminate form, as in this lovely passage. Quote, the Benjaminian divine violence should thus be conceived as divine in the precise sense of the old Latin motto vox populi vox dei, not in the perverse sense of we are doing it as mere instruments of the people's will, but as the heroic assumption of the solitude of sovereign decision. It is a decision to kill, to risk or lose one's own life, made in the absolute solitude, with no cover in the big other. If it is extra moral, it is also immoral. It does not give the agent the license to just kill with some kind of angelic innocence. The motto of divine violence is fiat justitia, periat mundus. It is justice, to the point of non-distinction between justice and vengeance, in which people, the anonymous part of no part, imposes its terror and makes other parts pay the price. The judgment day for the long history of oppression, exploitation, suffering, unquote. The anonymous part of no part, the big other. Listen to this scoundrel, this charlatan, this truly evil man, or buy his book with its lovely cover. You won't be the first. If I, dear open-minded progressive, ever become as popular... Her fingers are hard at work. Yes, they are. Popular ...on America's college campuses as Slavoj Žižek. You may feel free to expend as much concern over my secure relocation facilities as Professor Žižek's rusty old guillotine, which has what? lost not a drop of its eternal thirst. Did I mention that I'm not antinomian? From Rothbard to Robespierre is a long leap, no doubt, but we can observe some commonalities. Antinomians believe that the present state of affairs is unsatisfactory. So, of course, do I. The no uh, um, I am taking notes. I'm taking notes. Nomos is horribly corroded and encrusted with all mm. sorts of gunk. However, the pronomian's goal is to discern the real structure of order under this heap of garbage, scrape it down to the bare skeleton, replace any missing bones, and let the healthy tissue of reality grow around it. To the pronomian, this structure is arbitrary. Weirdly shaped borders? Leave them as they are. High taxes? All that tax revenue is paid to someone, who probably thinks of it as his property. Who am I to say it isn't? There are some property structures, notably patent rights, which I, like most libertarians, are find very unproductive. Oh, no. If so, the government needs to print money and buy them back. Fortunately, it has a large, high-speed intaglio press. The pronomian seeks to restore the nomos, whose outlines are clear under the mountain of Byzantine procedure, wholesale make-work and vote-buying, criminal miseducation, and other horrors of the liberal democratic state. The antinomian sees many of the same horrors, but he does not share the pronomian's goal, minimizing the reallocation of property and authority. Where the pronomian simply wants to replace the management, reorganize the staff, and discard the inscrutable volumes of precedent that have absconded with the name of law, the antinobian wants to destroy power structures that he conceives as illegitimate. And, of course, he wants to rebuild them according to his ideals, unless he is a complete nihilist, which, of course, some are. But it is the destructive tendency that makes antinomianism so successful. The utopia is never constructed. Wait, where the hell are we? <laughs> I feel like I haven't been. 
Or if it <laughs> it's is, okay. Don't worry it about is it. not a utopia. Success is a precondition to utopia, and success involves achieving the power to destroy. The most common species of antinomian is, of course, the simple anarchist. The most bloodthirsty and intrusive states of the 20th century were based on a philosophy, Marxism, which saw itself as fundamentally opposed to government. People really did believe that the socialist paradise would be something other than a state. Near where I live, on one of the most fashionable shopping streets in the world, is an anarchist bookstore. On its side wall is a mural. The mural contains two slogans. Quote, History remembers two kinds of people, those who kill and those who fight back. Anarchism strives toward a social organization which will establish well-being for all. Unquote. I am flabbergasted by how revealing these slogans are. History, at least when written by honest historians, remembers one kind of people, those who kill. It also notes that those who kill always conceive of themselves as fighting back. As for a social organization, it is simply our old friend, the state. Thus, anarchism defines it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, like, at the end of the day, uh, this is like, uh, you know, sloganizing, right? Uh, it's it's meant to be made for some kind of political purpose. It's not meant to be actually something, you know, uh, that meaningful, right? Two kinds of people, those who kill and those who fight back. I think it's rather, you know, if you want it to be as accurate as possible, it would be something like along the signs of this, right? History remembers two kinds of people. Those who antagonize. Wait, those who, uh, well, initiate the act of conflict and those who kill in self-defense. Um, anarchism uh, strives towards, you know, a stateless, a stateless uh, society, less society uh, environment place, which will establish well-being uh, for all in a state of utilitarian based benefit or something. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so, it is an attempt to capture the state and its juicy revenues through extortion, robbery, and murder. Well, no, no well, okay, no, that's, that's, okay. No, oh, wait, hold on, slow down. That's not, no, wait, hold on. Somebody has not been reading anarchist theory either. Okay, never mind. <laughs> when it succeeds, it will distribute the loot among its accomplices Wait, what? and establish well-being for all, at least in theory. As we've seen, the one thing an antinomian what? cannot abide is- Wait, hold on, you can't go- Wait, I hope he doesn't actually mean this. I think that's sarcastic, right? That has to be sarcastic. ...is a formal and immutable distribution of the revenues of state. He must constantly redistribute. He must wash his hands on the stream of cash giving to Peter and taking from Paul, or his supporters have no reason to support him. In other words, he is basically a criminal. Why is antinomianism, this criminal ideology, so popular? Fashionable, even. Why is it such a good fit for Q? Because people love power, and any movement with the power, power to destroy anything, or even just change it, has that <sighs> power. Antinomianism allows young aristocrats to engage in the activity that has been the favorite sport of young aristocrats since Alcibiades was a little boy, scheming for power. According to this article, for example, there are over 7,500 nonprofits in the Bay Area, 3,800 of which deal with sustainability issues. These appear to employ approximately half of our fair city's jeunesse dorée, occupying the best jeunesse years of their lives and paying them squat. Meanwhile, container ships full of empty boxes thunder out the Golden Gate, along with approximately $2 trillion a year of little green pieces of paper. However, if you're 23 and all you care about is getting laid, interning at a nonprofit is definitely the way to go. Amidst all this appalling nonsense, productive people keep their heads down and manage to engage in a few remaining productive pursuits. The nomos endures. Nor, not even if the good one is elected, will the guillotine and the tumbrils reappear anytime soon. Uh, the spoiler alert, <laughs> Obama did actually get reelected. Antinomianism leaves its scars nonetheless, almost literally. 
The simplicity and flexibility of the nomos creates, or should create, an endless stream of diversity in the best sense of the word. It's almost impossible to imagine the variety of schools, for example, that would spring up if all parents could educate their children as they saw fit. Structures of voluntary agreement tend to rely heavily on mere personal decision, and the products and services they create tend to embody personal style. For example, one of the many reasons that Belle Epoque buildings tend to be so much more attractive than post-war buildings is, I think, that sign-off on the design was much more likely to be in the hands of an individual than a committee. Antinomianism, with its love for reaching into these structures of private agreement and breaking them to serve some nominally noble purpose, has the general effect of replacing individual decisions with committee decisions, personal responsibility with process, and personal taste with official aesthetics. The final stage is the worst form of bureaucracy. Well, I mean, not necessarily, right? Like, you, you don't know if, like, the old art style is simply better just because it's just simply better, right? Or maybe it's also because of a personal preference, or maybe it's just in style at the time, or or any of these reasons. It, it, it could literally just be any reason, and, and we don't know, right? Like, it's just, like, there's a lot of questions, and yeah, it could literally just be for any reason. Chrissy, litigation, an invisible tyrant whose arms wrap tighter and tighter around us every year. This is sclerosis, scar tissue, Dilbert, Brezhnev, boredom and incompetence for everyone, everywhere. Most observers interpret bureaucratic sclerosis as a sign of a government which is too powerful. In fact, it is a sign of a government which is too weak. If 17 officials need to provide sign-off for you to repaint the fence in your front yard, this is not because George W. Bush, El Maximo Jefe, was so concerned about the toxicity of red paint that he wants to make 17 times sure that no wandering fruit flies are splattered with nefarious chemicals. It is because a lot of people have succeeded in making work for themselves, and that work has been spread wide and well. They are thriving off tiny pinholes through which power leaks out of the state. A strong unauthority would plug the leaks and retire the officials. Outside the communist bloc proper, of course, the ultimate in power leakage and resulting bureaucracy oh, was India's infamous Permit Raj, which still to some extent exists. Needless to say, Wait, if the subcontinent was run on a profit what basis, to the mean? Permit Raj would not be good business. In fact, quite amusingly, and with no apparent sense of irony, our favorite newspaper recently printed an article in which the following lines appear. Quote, Vietnam's biggest selling point for many companies is its political stability. Like China, it has a nominally communist one-party system that crushes dissent, keeps the military <laughs> under tight control, and changes government policies and leaders slowly. Communism means more stability, Mr. Xu, the chief financial officer of Texan, said, voicing a common view among Asian executives who make investment decisions. At least a few American executives agree, although they never say so on the record. Democracies, like those in Thailand and the Philippines, have proved more vulnerable to military coups and instability. A military coup in Thailand in September 2006 was briefly followed by an attempt, never completed, to impose nationalistic legislation penalizing foreign companies. That sent the wrong signal that we would not welcome foreign investment. This has ruined the confidence hey, of investors locally sniffer. and Hello. internationally, the finance minister Surapong Subwangli said in an interview in Bangkok. Unquote. The ironies. Of course, perhaps it is not so ironic after oh. all, as perhaps the main reason that the old China hands, the men oh such God, as I'm Owen Latimer, who Jesus. by manipulating procedural outcomes gave China to Mao, thought the communists were the shizzle, is that they were obviously so strong. America could really do great mm. things in Asia with the ruthlessly indoctrinated divisions of the PLA on its side, as opposed to Chiang Kai-shek, who looked like his main interests were opium and little boys. After 50 million deaths and the annihilation of traditional Chinese culture, what still remains is that strength. There is not much antinomianism in China, which has reduced its totalitarian pretensions to one simple and easily obeyed rule. Do not challenge the party for power. The result, though profoundly flawed, is the most successful capitalist country in the world. All things considered, it is certainly one of the best to do business in, as the article describes. And there is another effect. 
Did you spend Sunday hanging with in real life friends? No, no, I did not. But I'm just a uh, you know uh, sleepy in general, honestly. Um, yeah. Hmm. Just gonna take a nap in my chair. All right. Of antinomianism. This. Mm. That's how we do it out here, man. In my primitive search of the Pravda, I... I'll be honest, I think I might end stream early, uh, just after this or something like that, but we'll see, we'll see, we'll see, we'll see, okay? We'll see how I feel. But, um... Yeah, I, I think I do after this. I, I, I think I want to be able to... Can we get an update on your weird neighbor? I don't know, I don't know. But also, like, another thing is this, okay? Um, I do want to go over, uh, Lucy Hayes's, uh, you know, uh, Lemkin's video and I'll show you guys. I wanted to show you guys, but I find yeah, no evidence this that first. this happened. Therefore, I must conclude that it did not. And the video is fake mm -hmm. because imagine the breach of the lines between barbarism and civilization <sighs> that this would represent. If you could show this video to an American of 1908, he would simply conclude that civilization has collapsed. It is not. It lives. 580 is safe, mostly, I think. This sort of thing simply can't happen. But it can. And it can go on for quite a while without probably affecting my life. Too much. Nevertheless, it is not getting better. It is getting worse. And nobody is proposing anything like anything that would fix it. Except, of course, for me. And I'm crazy. So Q, of course, is left. And M is right. That is, M, pronomianism, is the essential principle of the political right wing. We very rarely see this principle in anything like its undiluted form, but still, why dilute it? Why look around for partial fixes? Why not cure the problem in one step? Pure Toryism of this sort has a hidden advantage. It is a shelling point. True, it is very difficult to persuade people to abandon all of the different strains of antinomianism that have nested in their brain, each of which assures them that a simple restoration of the nomos, with sovereign bankruptcy and a plenary receiver, is unthinkably fascist. However, the eternal problem Travel in organizing stranger. any what kind of reactionary movement what, is that why? if you can get two conservatives together in a that room, language? you can generally persuade them to form three political parties. Dissidents, by definition, are people who think for themselves. They do not have the advantage of the Q virus, which pulls them all together around the good one. And like normal people, they tend to disagree. This is why the search for the essential principle, the nomos, the philosopher's stone of the right wing, matters. If you can persuade those who distrust the system as it is to discard everything, liberal or conservative, not just diversity and the good one and police who hug criminals, but even the Constitution and the flag and the world wars and democracy and the pledge and the Bill of Rights and all the rest of that stale mythology. If you can talk your audience down to that bare metal, convince them that their political system is scrap, that it is not even remotely recoverable, and then present them with a single principle of government that is at or near this level of simplicity, you'll have a group of people who are all on exactly the same page. This, in a word, is organization and organization is what gets things done okay all right yeah that's what he's saying is that he's basically saying everything is a lie and that's why you need neo-monarchism is because you need a whole new system and that whole new system is neo-monarchism uh the thing is is that uh yeah um i can't ascribe to that i can't ascribe to that i can't ascribe to that um uh, I don't get why uh, you wouldn't be able to, you know, take it incrementally um, and instead have to, like, burn everything down. Um, and if you're not going to be doing, like, a revolution, right, like, uh, you would instead just be doing some kind of, like, hostile, not hostile takeover, but, like, just, you know, the slow takeover part. No, 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 fast takeover part, but like peacefully, I guess. But I don't know, like it just sounds all extra weird or something like that. What if monarchism is a lie too? Maybe that's just more likely, I don't know. Well, it's happened, but I think we, um, I think uh, our standards are pretty high, so 
I mean, yeah, that's about it. <sighs> Dude, guys, I, I, I don't know. I think I wanna... I might just go to sleep. I might just go to sleep, honestly. <laughs> I might just go to sleep, guys. Holy crap. Dude, I... Should I just do a... Should I just do a sleep stream? Should I just do a sleep stream? Maybe tomorrow I should just do an extra long stream, okay? Maybe tomorrow I should just do an extra long stream. And then, um, extra, 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 extra long stream, all right? Um, if you got, by the way, guys, if you... If you guys want to catch me, um, on other people's streams and stuff, just check Tom Foolery, all right? Sometimes I'm on there. Um, another person's, you know, chat, sometimes I'm in chat is, uh, Dev or Short Fat Taku. Um, sometimes I'm also there in that chat. Um, sometimes I'm also, you know, uh, at times, um, yeah. So, you know, there's different kinds of streams and different kinds of stuff and content that I'm in. So, yeah, it's not like the only, you know, um, people or whatever the heck. I have bridges. Okay, I still have bridges. Okay. Um, but also... Uh, yeah, sleep stream. All right, we're gonna, we're gonna do a sleep stream. <laughs> okay, guys, listen. I hope you guys have a wonderful, wonderful day, and uh, I'll see you guys later, okay? All right. <laughs> see ya. Bye. Good night. See ya. Bye. See ya.